In life, they're magic. They're golden because they lived, we had new dreams. John Lennon helped us imagine. Their lives have taken on a whole new dimension. In shocking detail now, we hear tales of bizarre sex, sordid drug habits, personal degradation, and mental illness. But who will defend the dead? Those who love them, family, friends, fans, wonder if there are any limits on the parade to the cash register because they know that scandal sells. And for people like John Lennon's former mistress, May Pang, who told all about loving John just a few years back, there are no limits about what can be written about the dead. When a star is gone, it's open season, as digging the dirt on the dead is our focus on this edition of Geraldo. You know, I wonder, I wonder if it isn't some weird ultimate index of stardom, a star's final measure of real glamour, real clout, the measure of earning power from even beyond the grave as book after book, headline after headline reveals secrets. We, the buying public, seem dying to learn. But how much of a star's weaknesses do we really want to know? John Lennon also lives in Imagine, a new film from Warner Brothers. Its release is well-timed, following as it does on the muddy heels of a book which alleges Lennon suffered from everything from drug to wife abuse. Yoko is also severely criticized, but she at least is alive to defend herself. Were you ever the Dragon Lady? Um, Dragon Lady. <laughs> well, I don't know what Dragon Lady means, but Dragon probably um, symbolizes something that is unique and very strong. And if that's what it is, uh, I'm on it. But after all the controversy has calmed and the charges are forgotten, there will always be John's music. Lennon. While Albert Goldman's controversial best-selling biography is told from the outside of John's life looking in, an insider, John's former mistress May Pang, has given the world her version of John in her book of some years ago called Loving John. May, welcome. Thank you. You know, we uh, go back a long way. Yes, we do. So to speak. We met, uh, I guess, back in 1971, 1972. That 71. Time, 71, 72. you were working for John. I was friendly with him. He did a benefit concert at my urging, etc. I remember when your book came out, uh, your book about your affair with John. I remember being very angry at you because at that time there had been... Goldman's book obviously wasn't out yet. There was the public's image of John. There was Strawberry Fields, the park dedicated to his memory in Central Park. There uh, were other kinds of testimonials to the man's greatness, to his music. And what you wrote about was something else. You wrote about a very fragile man, a man who had some real problems. Um, wh why did you do it? Why did you tell that story? I told that story only because I got tired of other people writing about our situation, our affair as you call it, um, it was so different. He was not always drunk, and I had to explain that. And, you know, at that time, you talk about his frailties. Well, he was in the papers talking in his drunken stupor. People, all the media just blew it out of proportion. So I got tired of seeing all that, and I decided it was time to tell my side of the story. But the portrait that you paint isn't all that flattering. You talk about John's warts, so to speak, as well as uh, his obvious greatness. Yeah, well... Everybody's human, and he has his faults, and he also has his greatness. And in the book, it shows both sides. Was he, as Albert Goldman alleges, a homosexual? Well, not to my knowledge. If you know, he wasn't. He was a. To me, he was a great lover. So you had a, a normal kind of <laughs> sexual relationship. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, he had no tendencies. Homosexual tendencies when I was with him. Let's put it that way. Was he? as Goldman alleges, a heroin addict. Well, I know that he had taken heroin before when I first met them, him and Yoko, um, in the early uh, 70, but not during my time. Now, afterwards, I don't know. When we split up, I have no idea. I guess the third uh, most sensational charge involves the uh, statement by Albert Goldman that John was anorexic. Well, I did see John in 1978. And when he did come over to my apartment, he was a bit thin. He was about 135 pounds, but he told me that he was on a macrobiotic diet. 
135 pounds. Mm -hmm. He was a bit taller than I. I Five foot 11. 11. Mm -hmm. uh, 135 pounds. He was always thin, but he had a pot belly. As well. Yes. He couldn't get rid of that. That's the one thing he did say. But he definitely wasn't anorexic. No, I mean, I, don't, I didn't see him as an anorexic. I did see him very thin. And he told me that he took a he was on a macrobiotic diet and he lost weight. He was always conscious of his weight. Is it true that Yoko arranged your affair with John? Yes, it's true. She sat me down in the office one day and she said, we're having problems, which everybody in the house, in, you know, who's working for them knew. And we were sitting there uh, together and she looked over at me. She goes, well, you know, we're going to have, um, you know, John's going to start seeing other people because we're not getting along. And I just stared at her and I said, yes. And I'm thinking, who am I going to be working for, him or her? And next thing you know, she said, well, you know, I know that he likes you. And I said, excuse me? And she said, I know he likes you, and I know you're going to be good for him. But I said, but I don't want your husband. She said, that's okay. I know you're not, you're not wanting it. You don't want him, but uh, it's okay. I think you'll be good for him. You didn't love John. Not at the time. I loved him as a person. I liked him as a person. Everybody okay? loved him as a person. Right. But you had no romantic feelings for John. No, not at all. And yet you agreed to accept this relationship. No, I didn't agree at first. John, in the end, pursued me. And his charm won me over. Within a relatively short time, Meg, right. you agreed to be John's girlfriend, mistress, whatever you call it. He took me out on a date. That's basically how it starts. And we did live together separately away from the household. And he did it with the advice and consent of his wife. Right. So you accepted, in essence, the position of what? what uh, his uh, American geisha? No. Because I did it for love. I mean, that was, I wasn't paid. Now. What? How could you say you did it for love when you what? didn't love John? Because by the time you go out with somebody, you go out with them, you don't fall in love with somebody on the first date. But May, would you have gone with, uh, all right, here, this, okay. this is his wife. She says, uh, you go with my husband. He works in uh, the electronics industry. You wouldn't go with the uh, electrician or the electrical engineer. You went because it was John Lennon. That's not true. Uh, hold on, that's not true. Because if I wanted John, this was like, a, we're talking, if I wanted John, I was working for him for three years. I had no desires. I had no desires at but all. But that's my point. I had no desires. But he then, I did not know that he liked me. That's what I found out. Did after. John like you or was John like you? following Yoko's orders. No, he liked me because Yoko he knew mm -hmm. that John was going to start fooling around on her. Right. Yoko knew she could control you. That's true. Yoko picked the safe choice. Here, John, go have some fun with May, knowing that she could reel him back in anytime she wanted. Well, if you're talking about reeling him back in, it didn't take, it took a long time. We lived together for a year and a half. But ultimately, he went home. He went home, ultimately, but we never stopped our relationship. Are you saying the affair continued after John went back with you? We remained friends, and we were very close, even up until the time he died. The question is directed to me, and uh, there's a new movie coming out, I understand, on John Lennon's life. I One, wondered if you've seen it. And, I only saw uh, oh, yeah, Go ahead. I'm sorry. And uh, how much dirt do you feel is in it, especially in regards to yourself? I did it. Uh, they gave me 30 seconds. <laughs> and the only thing I talk about that I did see, and they were kind enough to let me see my segment, was the fact that during the time that John and I were together, he was the most prolific musically. And talk about the time that Paul McCartney used to say, you know, come over to our house, and, and Ringo, and George, and Elton, and Mick, you know, Jagger, um, you know, all those. But, that's, um, that's one thing that uh, I think that may, one point she makes that you have to agree with. They talk about John Lennon's lost weekend. After Yoko arranged this bizarre, or at least the arrangement was bizarre, right. uh, and May and John went off to live on the West Coast, For it long. is generally assumed, because John was caught a couple of times very drunk in public, right, it's about a couple that of it was times. a lost weekend that lost, lasted 14 months. He was a wild man at the time. Right. He was drinking too much at the time. Right. When you hang out with Harry Nielsen, you don't have much choice here. <laughs> but he was also writing music. Yes, he was doing a lot of music, and that's what the book explains, that he wasn't always drunk, because he was there to do all the music. Hi. Um, uh, there was an article recently in the Newsday, and I was curious. Uh, newspaper? 
Right. The Newsday had said that you work basically from sunup to sundown, even past that point, seven days a week. And I'm curious, if you did not love John Lennon, why did you work like, like a slave? Or I guess that's a good question. At the time, I was 22. Well, I started with them when I was 20. And I, I loved the idea of working. And music was just my whole life. And working from sun from sun up to sundown was something that was another experience for me and i enjoyed it so much that it didn't bother me but i did work an awful lot and did not get paid for overtime as a flat rate was yoko really as intimidating was she really the dragon she lady? was very intimidating i mean she scared a lot of people in the house when she said something everybody just sort of like got quiet and sort of did what they had to do but you worked around it and it was fine she used to call me at three in the morning four in the morning six in the morning whatever hour uh, I've seen the film Imagine. It's an authorized biography, so you don't see the, right. the, a lot of the heavy dirt that you hear in some of the biographies, but I think it's fair and balanced. And there are some beautiful uh, pictures of John. I mean, some, they, they have the camera on them a lot, those two, John and Yoko. And there are some nice scenes that I've never seen before, so I think it's definitely worth seeing. Okay, we'll be right back. More questions for our guests. <laughs> You said your involvement with um, Yoko Lennon, she involved and in arranged your relationship with John. Mm -hmm. What relationship do you have with Yoko at this time? And also, how do you observe John's death? Ooh. I don't have a relationship with Yoko. I've tried contacting her many times after John had died. She wouldn't return any of my phone calls. In fact, I just recently ran into her in London a week ago or so. and. Um, I was there and I wanted to say hello to her. I stood in her path and she just looked the other way and was like just a little afraid to even see me. Just walked away. And as far as John's death, it was a sad thing. Um, it's very hard, to, you know, we always, we always hear of John all the time because whether it be for the music or read about him, he's always going to be around, you know. Do you remember where you were when you found out John died and how did you feel at that moment? Yes, I was up at the, on an, on, in the Upper West Side at a friend's apartment having dinner, and I had heard that over the radio, and my heart just sank. I just didn't know what else. Tell us more about that in our final segment. We'll be right back. I saw John just six weeks before he was killed, and I was also on the Upper West Side of Manhattan when it happened, and it was just so devastating. I really felt the end of an era. Mm -hmm. What'd you do? Afterwards, I ran home, and I started calling people, and phones were ringing, and I got a call from uh, my girlfriend in London who works for Ringo, and she said, I want the name of the hospital, I want the telephone number, and I said, forget it, he's dead. And she just hung up the phone screaming at saying, what's wrong with your bloody country? And then I called David Bowie's house, and uh, his assistant picked up, and she said, what are you talking about? I said, John's gone. She says, come down here. Don't be alone. Because David Bowie was also doing Elephant Men at the time. And all of us sat at David's house. Everybody, thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye-bye.